As we are heading into a harsh winter that will surely be dominated by the second wave of COVID-19, I want to answer the question that's on everyone's mind. What can we expect from 2021 and how this pandemic will finally end? I'm Dr. Bertala Meshko and you're watching The Medical Futurist. The pandemic still rages on with no end in our immediate future. We are still logging almost 300-400,000 cases each day, and while a handful of countries did manage to get the case numbers under control, in most places COVID is spreading like wildfire, while some governments haven't even simply given up on stopping it. To forecast what this winter and 2021 will look like, first we have to explore four aspects of how we are handling things now. First, the testing. While we are holding our breath for the vaccine, there is another tool that can be a highly effective weapon in the fight against COVID. These are the rapid tests that fasten up the testing process and pave the way for at-home lab tests too. Until now, the standard for COVID-19 testing has revolved around two main methods, molecular and antibody testing. The former involves the iconic nasal or throat swab sampling, while the other detects antibodies in blood samples. The problem is that both methods require trained personnel and specific equipment to perform, and they can take hours or days to provide results. In case of an overburdened healthcare system, that could be weeks even. But the new rapid COVID tests can determine in minutes whether someone is infected with the virus. There are already tests that were approved by the FDA for emergency use. Abbott Laboratory's nasal swab test, for example, only costs $5 and gives the results in 15 minutes. But the main question is about accuracy. High sensitivity PCR tests have a nearly 100% accuracy in detecting infected people, even if only small amounts of the virus are present. But for example, the accuracy of Abbott's quick test drops to 75% if the test is performed a week after symptoms show. Experts even worry about the counterproductiveness of these rapid tests since misdetection can lead to spikes in cases. However, the road is paved and this fast rate of approvals also attests to a faster rate of innovation. The pandemic is pushing companies to develop more accurate and more rapid tests, and this evolution could usher the boom of at-home lab tests in the very near future. Second, we have to talk about the vaccine. Unfortunately, the vaccine development has had a few setbacks. First, it was Johnson & Johnson that had to pause the phase 3 clinical trials of its experimental vaccine because of an unexplained illness in one of the volunteers. Of course, the company was fast to respond, saying that even serious adverse events are an expected part of any clinical study, especially in large studies like theirs, but it definitely halts one of the most advanced vaccine candidates. Although, it's a good sign that only safe vaccines will be approved. And while overall there are almost 50 other vaccines out there in various stages of testing, one of the biggest questions is how we will know if we can trust one and the majority of the population will even take it. Vaccines typically require years of research and testing before reaching the market, but with the urgent need to end the COVID crisis, scientists around the world are undertaking the fastest vaccine development program in history. That doesn't mean they are not going to be safe, but here is what we need to pay attention to. For example, when the Russian government says that their Sputnik V vaccine has passed all necessary tests, when in reality it was approved before phase 3 trials even began, well, perhaps be cautious. Sputnik V is going to be a terrifying experiment on a mass scale, since the Russians plan to administer this barely tested vaccine to 10 million people per month, and only time will tell if it works if it misfires or if it has some severe side effects that we don't yet know about. As for its Western counterparts, you probably already have a bit more faith in them, but still, you should only trust independent scientists and medical professionals. You should trust your doctor's opinion, but they, in return, should require transparency from the drug makers and the government to be able to give informed advice. What does that look like in practice? In the US, the drug companies and the FDA should disclose trial data, their methods of analysis, and the professionals who review those data. As a policy, every vaccine candidate will have to go through two separate review boards before it gets to you. One through the trial's sponsoring institution, 
and one through the FDA. But since the former group is usually paid by the sponsoring company, there has to be transparency about who exactly looks at the results. Transparency is everything now because the stakes are just too high. Third, we had to talk about the current wave because now it's on a collision course with the regular seasonal flu. By itself, the flu can be devastating for elderly people or those with underlying conditions. Not to mention that, joined by COVID, these two diseases could overwhelm our healthcare systems and create a new shortage of hospital beds and equipment. So while the COVID vaccine is a bit further down the line, the vaccine for the seasonal flu is readily available. Should we take it? Well, there is a widespread misunderstanding of how influenza vaccines work. Since flu viruses mutate in a rapid pace, the effectiveness is on average only 50% and they have to be administered annually. They don't work the way the childhood vaccines we are familiar with do. And unfortunately, that might be the case with the COVID vaccine too. I hate to say it, but there is a fair chance that, co that the COVID vaccine will not give us full protection and have to be administered annually as well. But a 50% protection is better than zero, and that applies against both viruses. So with my whole family, we are going to get the flu shots like we do every single year. And I advise you to do the same. And to forecast the future, you have to look at the past too. In the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 and 19, the second and third waves were considerably deadlier than the first one. Now as we are heading into the second and third waves of the COVID pandemic, this might be the single most important time to take the flu shot and it can go a long way to protect you and your community. People who get the seasonal flu can easily mistake it for COVID-19 and as they seek medical care, they can get exposed too. The seasonal flu could also make them even more susceptible to contracting COVID and to developing a severe disease. And even if you take COVID out of the equation, the seasonal flu can cause serious complications and it's especially dangerous to people 65 and older, pregnant women and children younger than 5. So, take the shot, limit the risk, be responsible. And finally, we had to talk about leadership and misinformation. That's one of the biggest factors in how our future will play out. For countries where governments don't stop misinformation or, in some cases, are actually peddling misinformation, forecasting how their future will play out gets increasingly hard. For example, if the anti-vaxxer movement gets loud enough when the vaccine comes, they will just simply won't reach herd immunity and COVID will remain part of our lives for a lot longer. It's all about leadership and unfortunately there are still countries where medical professionals are not part of the conversation. Politicians are in denial and under a false assumption that protecting the economy and protecting the people are at odds with each other. In reality, in countries where the main priority is to protect the people, the virus's spread can be contained and the economy can thrive. Instead of these things being opposites, they go hand in hand. In New Zealand, where the government acted fast and strict, they are doing great and they face no limitations. So, let's get to the big question. Where are we heading? Beat COVID and the seasonal flu, we are looking at a harsh winter and even though we are more prepared than before, the signs are on the wall that we might be entering a period that's going to be even worse than it was when the virus first hit. So, there are three scenarios that I want to present to you. All of them are conceivable, but they have various percentages of becoming a reality. First, let's start with the, the fairy tale version. In this version, there are no more setbacks for the vaccine trials and we will be able to mass produce them fairly quickly. In the first few weeks, we will give it to the frontline workers, then the immune deficient patients who are at extreme risk, and then in the next few months, everyone who is in high risk demographics will be vaccinated. That would mean by the middle of 2021, the pandemic will be behind our backs and everything will be back to normal again. But I think we all feel that that just sounds too good to be true. So I would give this a, a probability of 10%. The second scenario is the most likely. In that case, by early next year, there will be a few vaccines that have gone through extensive testing and are approved. From then on, it will be some time until we mass produce a few hundred million shots and we administer it for those that are most in need of it. That whole process will take about a year. And if this whole thing works the way the seasonal flu shot does, 
by the time we finish with the vaccination program, we can start again with a new cocktail. Don't get me wrong, that's a manageable scenario. We've been able to live with the seasonal flu and the annual shots as well. So if it comes to that, we will beat COVID again and again, and it will always remain a small part of our lives. The goal is for the virus not to dominate us. But as you can see, it's most probable that at least till the end of 2021, not much will change. The vaccine is still far from ready, while the production and the rollout will take just as much time. Sure, there will be ups and downs and COVID will continue to hit us in waves, but expect masks to remain a part of our lives, while tourism and all the advantages of a fully efficient globalized world won't come back anytime soon. The worst part is, unfortunately, for those who live with a chronic disease. For them, access to efficient healthcare will be harder, and the risk of getting COVID as they are trying to treat something else will be terrifying. There will be a lot of excess death because of how overburdened our healthcare systems will be for the foreseeable future. As for those with minor issues, telemedicine and soon at-home lab tests will be the new norm. And we will only see doctors face-to-face -face when it's absolutely necessary. Overall, our lives will remain to be tightly interwoven with this pandemic in 2021. If I were a betting man, I would say this as by far the most likely scenario, giving it a probability of 60%. But of course, after the optimist and the realist scenario, we have to talk about the pessimist one as well. It's not likely, but it's not impossible either. First, in this scenario, we wouldn't get to the safe vaccines until the middle of 2021. Then will come the long months of mass producing and administering them, and that's only for the high-risk demographics. Herd immunity will be out of the question for 2021, and with only 50% efficient vaccines, the anti-vaxxer movement and the new mutations of the virus, we could start a perpetual war against COVID with almost no end in sight. That would mean that we could only reach something that resembles normalcy by 2022, 23, but by then, how we live now would not even look abnormal. We would get used to it. If you do the math, you know I would give this a probability of 30%. It is partially up to you which of these three scenarios will become reality. Every day, when we play by the rules, as uncomfortable as they are, but we push things towards the realist scenario. Keep social distancing, wear a mask, and take the seasonal flu shot. Protect each other. But if you ignore the danger that this pandemic poses to you and your community, you are pushing us towards the pessimistic version. And look at the bigger picture. If you're not afraid of COVID, good for you. But look at what it can do on a systematic level. It may not kill you, it may have a relatively low mortality, but while we are struggling with it, it's getting harder for patients with chronic conditions to get access, and we and this disease indirectly hurt them. Because there is a limit to what our healthcare systems can do, how many people they can save, and the more we let COVID dominate these systems, the more people will die, one way or another. So, since we are living in historic times, let's act like it. If you like this video and want to hear more about forecasting about COVID-19, please subscribe below.